this week on the program, rainwater harvesting. Um, a little closer to the idea of turning on a valve and your garden is suddenly sprinkled all automatically. Safer streets for next year's they students. They agreed 100% that the sign should come down and the sign was changed to, to vehicles yield to pedestrians while turning. A new program for kids in and, Guelph. And it's, what it's doing is drawing together all the people who provide services to youth um, in some form or another. All this and more coming up on First Local. Hello and welcome to First Local. This week we're here in the Rogers Television Studio and Liz and Doug are back there working on stories that you'll see later in the program. Before we get started, we've got to tell you about a brand new contest. That's right. First Local and the Woodburner want to give you an opportunity to win a barbecue worth over $700 from Duquesne in our Spot the Grill contest. All you have to do is spot the grill somewhere later on in the show and then give us a call at our contest hotline. It's 1-877-RTV-WINS or enter at www.rogerstelevision.com and let us know when you spotted the grill. All entries will be put into the draw to win the Duquesne Grill. Now, let's get on with the show. We're very proud of Guelph and its leadership role in all things environmental. While rainwater harvesting isn't a new concept, there's a pilot project underway that makes watering your garden with rainwater as easy as turning on a tap. Uh, Girk has been, as I said, selling rain barrels for about six years. And uh, we knew that, that we were getting to a point now with our water conservation projects that we had to adapt things. So about a year ago, we, we put together a proposal uh, to the government of Canada to spend six months doing a pilot project, doing research on a more sophisticated form of rooftop water harvesting. If you look at the normal rain barrel installation, somebody just puts a downpipe um, from their eave trough into a rain barrel, and the rain barrel fills, and often what happens is then it sits there. We felt really good about having a rain barrel, but how do you then get it into the garden? Our idea was to get an installation that made it easier, um, a little closer to the idea of turning on a valve and your garden is suddenly sprinkled all automatically. So what we've done is we built stands to hold the rain barrels that elevate them about three or three and a half feet off the ground and that will give us pressure. And then what we have done is simply let a hose from the barrels they're all linked together with hosing, and a hose goes into the garden, and in one area it goes into this drip irrigation system where the, the drips directly into the plants, and in another area we were using it, for, we simply had a hose, and we walked around and watered like you would with any hose attached to the city water system. My job in all of this at this point is to um, download the data that is being collected by the various loggers that we have set up. This particular one here is set up to the rain barrels behind me and what we're, well, the information I'm getting from this is the pressure level at different times since the last time that I downloaded the information. So that will tell us the level of the, the water in the barrels at one minute intervals. Um, some of the other information that I get is actually the uh, rainwater collection off the garage so we can tell exactly how much water has fallen and been collected. As we get further along in the, in the study, we can take all of this information and fit it together and have a look at sort of what's been going on with the water, the levels of the rain barrels and the rainwater that we've had and have a look at uh, maybe suggestions how this could be uh, utilized more efficiently for the homeowner. We're trying to bring some solutions to the community um, and it fits in with the broader commitment of conservation the City of Guelph has, uh, you know, conservation of energy and water use. I'm in charge of water quality for our project and basically we're looking at several components of water quality. We're looking at bacteria analysis, we're looking at the acidity of the water, the pH, we're looking at metals, and we're looking at the uh, debris in the water, the suspended solids. Well, once the tubes are in place, you're not moving them around. They are um, looking after the plants that need to be looked after. And I guess the important thing is to remember to turn the taps on and off as you do want to use them in the garden. Um, it's been a little bit of a challenge remembering to 
close the taps after we've opened them, but so far it's, it's worked quite well. School's out for the summer, but safety is a year-round concern. A school safety patrol review committee is working to have new measures put in place to make the walk to and from classes that much safer. As Doug Blackwood reports, we need your input. In March of 2002, 10 years after the last review, City Council asked that the school safety patrol program be reviewed so that the service could be reaffirmed. Over seven months, the review committee came up with 11 recommendations, including providing adult crossing guards. There are certain areas, uh, some that were identified, and I don't know exactly the spots that were identified by some of the schools and some of the uh, school associations that they were particularly concerned about, uh, basically because of the increase in traffic in the city. And uh, these are ones that are going to be looked at for possible consideration for adult uh, school crossing guards. The proposals have the support of the Upper Grand District School Board. Other measures include patrol training for principals and teachers, a school safety education program, and keeping the speed limit near schools down to 40 kilometers an hour. As of the end of June this year, there were 4,200 traffic tickets for speeding issued in the city. Now that's just phenomenal for a city of this size, uh, and the, but that's just the, the nature of the beast these days is with your traffic. All of us involved with this story chose this corner, Paisley and Silver Creek, as the site of which to do this item. And for one very good reason, the Paisley Road Public School right down there, this corner is a major concern when it comes to school safety. Because it's such a busy intersection, it's, it's very, very difficult to uh, consider that for school patrolling, in my opinion. I think some of the school patrollers have been uh, shouted abuse at, uh, which is very, very unfortunate because these children are doing a good job, they're showing leadership, they're showing participation in their community, and to have some of the things that have occurred uh, happen to them is, is very unfortunate. But we do have, I think, a general problem with um, drivers in this city, uh, going too fast, not stopping at uh, stop lights as they're supposed to, stop signs and so forth. The school also requested a review as parents were concerned after crossing guards at the corner were pulled. One parent, whose kids attend the school, found vehicles were openly ignoring a no right turn sign at the intersection, so she had the city change it to this one. So in November, I, I did a presentation to the Planning and Environment Safety Committee, and on my presentation that I gave to them, they agreed 100% that the sign should come down, and the sign was changed to, to vehicles yield to pedestrians while turning. And we had the neon signs put at each intersection coming into Paisley Road, this corner intersection mm -hmm. and um, and then after that was done it seemed to help somewhat but there still is the issue here that we need someone patrolling this intersection. Councillor Bert Whistle also noticed vehicles illegally turning right at the corner including a city bus. Another parent took a stand too partly as a member of the Paisley Road Public School Council. She says drivers use the intersection as a speedway adding more suggestions should be made. I thought that there would have been more recommendations made, but there wasn't, so we kind of have to work with what we've got. Um, I think the recommendations are all right, but I'm still being the one that's going to push for the adult crossing guard. I'm hoping this report maybe will be the push that we need to get things done. And you're going to keep pushing hard? Oh, definitely. I don't give up. <laughs> the committee's recommendations and a city staff report on the issue go before Council's Planning, Environment and Transportation Committee August 11th. The School Safety Patrol Review Committee report will include your input if you call Joanne Starr of City Traffic Services at 822-1260, extension 2278, or Councillor Bertwistle at 822-3478. The deadline is July 31st. I'm Doug Blackwood, First Local. It's time for our weekly Crime Stoppers feature. See if you can help area police solve a case of hit and run. Crime Stoppers need your help to solve this crime. A hit-and-run motor vehicle accident occurred on June 12th at 1 o'clock p.m. on Woolwich Street near Extra Street in Guelph. A 46-year-old woman was attempting to cross Woolwich Street when she was struck by a car that was northbound on Woolwich Street. The woman was knocked to the ground by the front right corner of the car. The car and driver continued northbound on Woolwich Street without stopping. The woman was treated and released at the Guelph General Hospital for minor injuries. The suspect vehicle is described as a blue car, make and model unknown. There is no description of the driver. 
Anyone with any information about this crime is asked to call Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-TIPS. You'll never be asked your name or to testify in court. Your information could be worth up to $1,000. Help protect our community. Call Crime Stoppers today. Many of you are actively pursuing the summer, but are you doing all you can to prevent injury? In this week's Lifestyle Tip, Teresa Piotrowski gives you some simple stretches to help you with your performance. Hi, my name is Teresa Piotrowski. I'm a physiotherapist here at the University of Guelph Health and Performance Center, and I'm going to talk to you today about some stretching for the lower extremities that is useful for all of our outdoor sports, whether it be ultimate frisbee, uh, baseball, soccer, football, maybe some beach volleyball. Um, having a good warm-up is always the most important thing before you go out for any sporting activity. And by a good warm-up, I mean running a few laps of the track or around the field to get the muscles loose, get blood flowing into the muscles before you try and stretch them. There's really no benefit into stretching a cold muscle, it's just not going to do the job. So a couple stretches I'm going to show you today are quite simple. And some of you have made, may have seen these already, but we'll go over the basic principles of stretching. The first one is for the calf muscles, and there's two that we're going to do. One, you're going to be leaning either against a partner or against a wall or a fence or a gate, and you've got the knee straight, heel stays on the ground, and you're reaching towards, lunging forward. The second one is very similar, except you're going to drop the knee, heel still stays on the ground, and you're stretching forward. You want to hold the stretch for 20 seconds, both legs, and you want to repeat it a couple times. Another stretch that you can do with a partner or with a chair or the fence or whatever it might be available to you at the field is for the quadriceps. You want to make sure that you're going to grab the heel, you're going to be pulling the leg up. You want to make sure that there's a straight line between your trunk and your leg. You don't want to be forward or out to the side or bending your trunk this way. So you're going to keep your hips forward, and you're going to hold again for 20 seconds and you're going to feel the stretch in the front of the leg here. A third stretch is for the hamstrings, the muscles at the back of the thigh. You can do it two ways. If you've got a bench or a chair, you can just reach forward and you're going to feel it in the back of the leg reaching towards the toes. If you're on a field where there's no benches, you're just going to have to kind of bend this leg and lunge towards the other leg and you're stretching out the back again, same as the other one, and you're going to hold that again for 20 seconds. Final stretch for the outside of the leg, which is very common in running injuries, it's for your ITB and your tensor fascia lata, and you'll end up feeling the stretch right along the side here. What you're going to do, hand either against the wall or your partner, you're going to step across and lunge or lean your hip in towards that partner or wall and you should feel a stretch, uh, like I said, on the outside again. All of these stretches, like I said earlier, should be held for about 20 seconds, and you want to do both sides, having a good stretching feeling, but it shouldn't be painful, and you want to repeat two or three times. If you have any other questions, give us a call or write in, and we'd be glad to answer them. While many of the animals we featured here on First Local have found homes, there are still plenty at the shelter waiting to meet you. Here's Renee Barker. Welcome back to the Guelph Humane Society. Our featured cat for adoption this week is Max. And Max is a very handsome, neutered male cat. He's about a year old. He's a medium-haired cat, and he's all white, except for a very unique caramel color marking on the top of his head. Max is a very affectionate, very inquisitive cat. He's quite curious, and he loves to play with his toys. Um, unfortunately, he was surrendered to the Humane Society because his previous owners were no longer in a position to care for him. He's doing very well here at the shelter. He really seems to enjoy the company of other cats. I believe that he would do well with dogs and children. So if you've been thinking about adding a feline companion to your household, I would highly recommend that you come down to the Guelph Humane Society and meet this wonderful cat. Our featured dog for adoption this week is Nanook. And Nanook is a husky. She's a spayed female. She's about five years old. And unfortunately, she was surrendered by her previous owner as they were no longer in a position to care for her. Nanook is a wonderful dog. Um, she has a great personality. She's very nice and gentle. Um, because of her breed, uh, being a husky, sometimes they do have a tendency to like to wander. So we do recommend that she go to a home where there's a fenced-in yard, or at least in an environment where uh, there's individuals who are able 
to spend quite a bit of time exercising her. Um, that is something that she definitely needs to keep her happy. Uh, she has uh, basic obedience skills and she's doing very well in the shelter obedience program. Um, we do recommend that she not go to a home where there's any cats or small children as she's never been exposed to them so we're not quite sure how she would do with that. She's an excellent dog. Uh, I think that anyone who's been looking for a canine companion to share their time with um, coming down to the shelter to meet Nanook would be an excellent idea. If you have any questions about the animals featured for adoption today or any of the other animals available for adoption at the Guelph Humane Society, please feel free to give us a call at 824-3091. Now, who wants to be inside on a day like this? Not me, and certainly not Les Sulphur from the Woodburner. We're outside on your deck. And if we're going to do some entertaining, I guess we need a little furniture first. We sure do. Yeah, we got to start planning right away to figure out what we're going to do with this deck to get people out here. This is a pretty big deck space to fill. So when, if I were coming into the wood burner and you were going to help me fill it with some furniture, how would we start that process? Well, we always start the process by finding out how many people are in the family. And that sort of dictates the, the number of chairs you're going to need. And the important thing with that is what size and shape is your deck so that you can decide what size your table is going to be, what shape it's going to be, and of course, how much room it's going to take up. And that, the important thing there is that to remember that a chair takes up three feet plus your table. So you've got your table, three feet on each side. Now you can start planning how many chairs you want, how much room is going to take up on your deck. Oh, no, that's a good point. Now, you've got a planner at the wood burner, too, that people can use to sort of configure these things. We sure do, yeah. And now, you mentioned a table, but maybe I don't want a table out here. What are some of the other options I could look at? Well, we can go into, um, there's regular dining sets we can right. go into. We can go into a bar sets because their bar sets are very popular. And we can even go into basically a family room set now. I'll tell you what, why don't we change this space into a family area, an outdoor living area, because people really want to be outdoors in the summertime. Sure can, let's okay, go. Okay, we'll make this the next room in your house and change it all over. Well, Susan, how do you like your new outdoor family room? I love this. This is beautiful. You've got the furniture here, some flowers. All of a sudden, it's like another room to your house. We've expanded our living space. Absolutely, and we can expand it more with other other items if you wanted to, or we can take other themes. We can go into the uh, bar scene and, and get bar right. tables up here. We can do the dining room. We can get lounge chairs and even more footstools. Here's this week's first local entertainment update. Of course, July 25th, 26th, and 27th, it's the 20th annual Hillside Festival happening out at Guelph Lake. There's always tons of great foods, lots of arts and crafts vendors, and spoken word and music performances all day and all night, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Some featured performers are Sarah Harmer, uh, Stacey Earle, who is Steve's little brother, Chris Brown and Kate Fenner, they've been featured here on First Local before, Luther Wright and the Wrongs in Warsaw Pack, a million others. So get your tickets at the bookshelf downtown or you can head to the website at www.hillside.on.ca. On August the 3rd, the Kingpins are headed to the trash, and that's going to be a straight-up rock and roll show. Should be tons of fun. But before you head there, you may want to head to John Galt Park, because we had so much fun last year at Guelph Fest, we've decided to do it again. And here are the details. My name is Edward Johnson. I'd like to welcome you to Guelph Fest, a festival celebrating the heritage of Guelph. Guelph Fest is a celebration of Guelph's heritage and the region through entertainment and education. We have a lot of surprises, a lot of things that we had last year that were very successful, like the hand car rails, canoe rides on the river, we have the cross-cut song demonstration, a number of pioneer artisans and craftsmen who will be coming this year. Along with those we had last year, we also have sheep shearing, we have a cooper, which is a barrel maker, and many other pioneer crafts that the Guelph Museums have brought out for us. As well as that, we have many activities for the children. We have an entire children's area where we'll be having fun activities of days gone by. 
stilt walking, we can do hoops and sticks and many other activities, a petting zoo, lots of things for the children. In the Du Maurier Theatre, we'll be having something called an old time radio show where James Gordon takes us a look at the back, back of the history of Guelph through decades of history in the radio eras. So we start in 1927 with Edward Johnson singing a couple of his operas and all the way to the present day in Cuz, which is 2005. So we do do a little time travel in the old time radio show. In the Cooperators Theatre, we are alternating Gil Stelter doing historical tour of some of the architecture of Guelph with Love Letters, a lovely play about love letters of Edward Johnson and his fiancée, Beatrice De Nero. I was a somewhat known tenor back in the 19th, uh, 1900s, 1910. And one of the things I did was that I went on to uh, run the Metropolitan Opera House in New York. But prior to that, I had quite a, an existence as a tenor, and I started here in Guelph. Uh, singing sacred songs and parlor songs and eventually ended up touring around the country. In many ways, Beatrice was the woman behind the man. She guided my future and she guided my development uh, to the point that I became an internationally known tenor. This event is absolutely free for all demonstrations, activities, performances, everything but the food is free, and it's on Sunday, August 3rd, from noon to 7, John Galt Park, right here at River Run Centre. At City Council's last meeting, the Guelph Community Youth Strategy received unanimous approval. It's a big step forward for young people of all backgrounds to contribute to the community that they call home. Liz Snyder has more. It's a four-stage, five-year plan for Guelph residents ages 12 to 18. Give the youth more voice in the city to um, uh, coordinate and collaborate more with youth service providers. Give the youth more safe space um, and a stronger voice with council and within the city and improve the image of youth. There's an image problem that, that most adults see. They see you know, that small percentage of youth that gets reported in the media, yet the majority of youth aren't like that. They're not these rowdy people that go out and uh, break into cars and smash windows and steal. They're not, that, they're not that, but this is the image adults see. And I remember, I keep on thinking of this, when they were younger, their adults said, their, their parents said, you know, we don't like your music, we don't like the way you dress, we don't like everything, and here we are in 2003, and it's the same thing again and again, and I just wonder when is it going to ever stop? And this just might be that beginning. Well, I think it's really exciting for the city. Um, I think it's a really good youth strategy. Um, there seems to be a lot of support for it and excitement from the youth themselves, so I think that's probably a good indicator. And, uh, you know, it, it's very much um, looking at how to engage youth both enga and engaging them in the decision-making as well, which I think is really positive. Uh, it's also looking about how we can integrate this into the neighborhood work that we're already doing and so that we can address this at a real grassroots neighborhood level and identify what the needs are in that particular neighborhood and how we can particularly, how we can fill those needs. And, and it's, what it's doing is drawing together all the people who provide services to youth um, in some form or another so that we can take the fullest advantage of, of um, what we have in the community already and, and make that work better for ensuring that youth have something that's constructive for them and they feel good about. And it's been a while coming. Identified in 1997 as a priority for Guelph, this strategy builds on many years of youth initiatives and includes results from a What Do You Want Done Youth Forum. The forum again was held on the 23rd, on the February 2003. Eight counselors were in attendance with over 50 youth, and some of the key things were that the kids needed a way to voice their um, issues. So they need respect. They want respect from their elders. They want respect from the merchants of Guelph and they need respect from their peers. They need a place to go, a place to call their own, that they're not going to feel they have to do something all the time. So they need spaces. So they are asking for youth centers. They're looking for places to go that they can just hang out. I am in charge of coordinating the youth event, which is going to be held on Wednesday, October the 1st. 
at the Guelph Youth Music Center, and it's going to be a Battle of the Bands type event. We're in the planning stages right now, so we have over 15 youth currently holding different committees, working with city staff and with us, and we're doing registration, bands, and hopefully we're going to try and attract as many kids as we can. It's designed to be low cost to no cost, so it'll be about between two to three dollars for people to attend. Hopefully able to max out the capacity, which will be close to 300 people. And it's actually International Music Day, which ties in nicely with the Battle of Bands. And the Music Center has been phenomenal. We're going to get the facilities from them and have a really good turnout, hopefully. Starts at 5.30 and then hopefully ties up around 9 for everyone to go home in time to go to school the next morning. If you'd like more information about the Guelph Community Youth Strategy or the launch event, email guelphyouth at city.guelph.on.ca or phone 837-5657, extension 227. Reporting for First Local, this is Liz Snyder. Well, that is it for this week's edition of First Local. Thank you very much for watching, and keep those calls and emails coming. We love hearing what you think. The phone number is one 410 2020 or you can email firstlocal at rogers.com. I'm Stacey Hare. And I'm John Botton, reminding you to enter our fabulous Spot the Grill contest. We'd also like to thank our dedicated volunteers for helping make this program happen week in and week out. Listen, make it a great one, and we'll see you next time right here on First Local. I buy a satellite TV system from you. If I buy a separate receiver for each set, that could get pretty expensive. Why would anyone want more than one television in their house? We have cable TV and additional outlets didn't cost much at all. I don't think that's relevant. Isn't it true that additional outlets with satellite TV can be much more expensive than cable TV? People don't need more than one television in their house. If you're thinking about satellite TV, you might want to think twice. Cable TV. People have one refrigerator, one washing machine, one television. It's called the 12-week program. True, it can be tough, and the rewards at the end of the day may not be easy to see, but it takes commitment, discipline, and an inner desire to improve personal health and fitness. Rogers Television tunes into the lives of these 10 people as they work towards their own goals of healthier living. Hear their stories. See their dedication as they share three months of their journey to a better life. The 12-week program, only on Rogers Television. Hi, Lisa Leachman here at Mohawk Park in Brantford for FYI. Riverfest has gone kid crazy this year. It's called Kids Fest, and it's a two-day festival happening August 9th through the 10th here at Mohawk Park in Brantford. Kelly Defoe, one of the event organizers, is here. Kelly, this is a fabulous weekend aimed at the whole family. Tell me about Kids Fest. For the young and young at heart, there'll be displays, attractions, entertainment, uh, sporting events all throughout the park for both days on August 9th and 10th. All right, of course, admission is free, and I understand there's some great amusements happening with proceeds to a local charity. Tell me about that. That's right. This year we partnered with Sunshine Dream for Kids, and the proceeds from the events this year will go to help kids in our area make their dreams come true. Fabulous to be able to support a local charity all while having a great time. Book your calendar now for Kids Fest happening August 9th through to the 10th here at Mohawk Park in Bramford. I'm Lisa Leachman and we'll see you here next time on FYI.
Welcome to Daytime. This is Thursday, Thursday, July 24th. I'm Susan Cook-Shear. I'm Mark 